tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. <laughs> Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with audio adaptations of two rounds of frightening fiction about technological trouble and the evils of absolution. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Chris Fox and J.A. Conrath are voice talents Luis Bermudez and Kristen Holland. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> Our first tale tonight comes to us from author Chris Fox and is performed by Chilling Tales for Dark Nights 2019 Evil Idol voice acting competition champion, Luis Bermudez. In it, a gentleman gets more than he bargained for when he gets his hands on a device that is truly before its time. Or is it after? <laughs> Stay tuned and find out. Without further ado, I present to you I bought a working time machine. All of my life, I've heard people say we are heading into a new utopian age of progressive enlightenment. And while I really wanted to believe that to be true, with the things I have seen going on with the world, I've had to remain skeptical. But then, I saw the future for myself. My glimpse of what's to come and the experiences leading up to it started with my unexpected acquisition of a mundane item. The magazine was hidden amongst the old paperbacks I had bought at a used bookstore. Strange Things and Oddities, the cover proclaimed in a bright green font, with October 97 printed underneath it. Behind the text, an alien creature stared back at me. Grinning, I gave the magazine a quick flip through. Where did this come from? I wondered. I certainly didn't recall seeing the cashier put the item in the box, and the thing was in immaculate condition for being 20 years old. I gave it another quick look, then tossed the periodical onto the coffee table before going about my business. Later that evening, I was in a funk of boredom and nothing was helping, so I turned on the TV. I scanned through the channels, trying to find something worth watching, but after a bit, I just turned it off, giving up. There wasn't a damn thing worth watching on. I looked down at the coffee table and saw the magazine lying there, its bright, green title shining like a beacon. Might as well see what was going on back in good old 1997, I said, picking it up. Over the next hour, I was enveloped in the paranormal world of two decades ago. One very interesting article involved the account of a woman's sexual encounter with an alien, probably the one from the cover, I said to myself, smiling. There were many other interesting articles and columns. Then, when I got to the back, I found a classified section. It advertised a good variety of strange things, such as voodoo dolls and psychic readings, but one ad 
in particular caught my eye. Travel through time. Read the headline. The listing informed me that for the low price of $30 USD, I could have my very own time travel device. I don't know what possessed me, but I went and got my checkbook. I wrote out a check for the amount, addressed and stamped an envelope, then sealed the check inside. I mailed it the next day and immediately forgot about it. One afternoon, about six weeks later, I came home from work to find a shoebox-sized package sitting at my door. I didn't think I was expecting anything, and when I looked closer, I didn't recognize the shipper's address. I unlocked my door, picked up the box, and went inside. I sat the box on the coffee table and sliced open the tape with a pair of scissors. Inside was a smaller box labeled Chrono Industries Model TTD-005. Upon opening it, I found an instruction booklet and a small electronic device. Realization dawned. It was my time travel device. I'll admit, I never assumed to receive anything, but here it was. The device, which was roughly the size of a walkie-talkie, had a full keyboard, LED display, and a belt clip on the back. On the top of the TTD were a power switch and two buttons, labeled Start and Recall, respectively. For a time machine, the damn thing seemed pretty simple. I opened the user's manual. After a few minutes of reading, I had the gist of the device's operation. No time like the present, I said, switching the TTD on. The screen lit up with blue characters that displayed the current date and time. With no visible antenna, I wondered how or where the device received its information. But who was I to question such technology? I thought for a moment about where, or rather when, I would go first. I decided to start small and entered a destination of three days in the past. Then, I hit start. I honestly didn't know what to expect. The novelty of the thing alone was worth the 30 bucks I had spent on it, but after pushing the start button and nothing happening, I'll admit I was a little disappointed. The thing didn't even beep for God's sake. Oh well, I said to the device. At least you kept me entertained for half an hour. Carrying the TTD with me, I went over to my desk and turned on the computer. I figured I might as well see what kind of craziness was going on in the world. I opened my favorite news webpage and began scrolling through the headlines. Even though this had been my first visit to the site that day, the headlines all looked so familiar, and an overwhelming sense of deja vu hit me. My eyes fell on the device sitting on the desk. No way, I said in disbelief. It can't be. I scrolled back to the top of the page and read the date. If I'd been looking in a mirror, I'm sure I would have seen that the color had drained from my face. The date showed the fifth of the month where it should have said the eighth. With a shaking hand, I reached for the TTD and hit recall. Once again, there was no sound and no sense of activity, but the computer was now off. I turned it on and checked the news headlines. They were now different, and the date up top read the 8th. As impossible as it was to comprehend, I had just traveled through time. An hour later, I sat on my couch, staring at the TTD as it sat like a 10-ton weight on the coffee table. The implications of what had just happened to me were massive. This was supposed to be a joke. I ordered the thing out of a 20-year-old paranormal magazine for crying out loud. But yet I saw what I saw. I grabbed the device and left the apartment. There was a park about a block from my building and I began walking in its direction. I wanted to be completely sure of the device's legitimacy, and I had an idea of how to test it. I entered the park and walked around a bit before finding what I was looking for. It was a medium-sized pecan tree and I pulled out my phone and took a picture of it. Then, taking the TTD off of my belt, I set it for five years in the past and hit start. The change happened so fast and imperceptibly that my brain could barely process it. One moment, the tree was one size. The next, it was smaller. I took a picture and then hit recall. I took one more look at the now larger tree, then returned to my apartment. I downloaded both pictures to my computer 
and opened them side by side. At first glance, someone looking at the pictures wouldn't notice much out of the ordinary. If anything, they would probably think it was nothing more than a couple of pictures of the same tree taken years apart. But the timestamps told a different story. They showed the pictures were taken less than a minute apart, which was just the assurance I needed to know that the device was the real deal. I thought about the possibilities the TTD could open up for me. I could correct past mistakes I'd made, or even make myself rich 1,000 times over. Anything was possible, and it would be so easy. But I knew I could never do any of those things. My parents had raised me with morals, and using the TTD for personal gain would go against everything they had taught me. But I still felt like there was a reason for me having this device. In the end, I decided the best way for me to use TTD was to not use it at all. But before I retired the device for good, I would use it one last time. I had to see the future. I grabbed the TTD and headed out the door. I wanted to know where we were headed and if it was in the right or wrong direction, and in my hand was the means to do it. I went back to the park. I was planning to go at least ten years into the future, and there was no telling what could change in that amount of time. I didn't want to risk appearing or whatever in the wrong place, so the park seemed like the safest solution. After finding a nice wide open area, I set the TTD for today's date and time, but ten years from now. Here goes nothing, I said, pushing the start button. The park's calm, green beauty had been replaced by a barren landscape surrounded by the ruins of the burnt-out city. I looked around in awestruck horror as I walked to where the entrance of the park used to be, and once on the street, the real terror began. Wrecked and abandoned cars filled the streets, and everywhere I looked were the rotted corpses of human beings hanging from inverted metal crosses. Satanic-looking symbols were everywhere and instead of the usual sounds of the city, I could only hear the tortured screams of people all around me. What happened here? I wondered as I took in my horrific surroundings. Up ahead, movement caught my eye. Coming around a corner were a group of about eight people followed by two demonic-looking creatures. The people were all shackled to one another, and most of them had ragged and bloody gashes torn from their upper bodies where they had been flayed by their demonic guards. This was just too much, and I decided it was time to go. I turned and ran back to the park. Once there, I bent over and vomited, and when I was finished, I pushed recall. While I was relieved to see everything back to normal, I couldn't help but feel utter despair from the forbidden knowledge I now possessed. I returned to my apartment and removed the TTD from my belt. I looked at it for a long time before opening the back and removing the batteries, and then I busted the damn thing. I knew I shouldn't have blamed the device for what it had shown me, but I just didn't want it around anymore. Since that day, I have spent a lot of time thinking about the future and what I saw. I wish that I could say we can all band together and save the world, but I feel that based on the events currently unfolding, there is no way to change what is coming, but at least I can give you all a heads up. I hope you enjoyed I Bought a Working Time Machine, as written by Chris Fox and performed by Luis Bermudez. Up next, we've got a second sinister story for you, as written by best-selling author J.A. Conrath, and performed by Mr. Kristen Holland, host of the Nocturnal Transmissions podcast. If you enjoy Kristen's performance, please check out more of his work at nocturnaltransmission.au or find him on Apple Podcasts or your app of choice. Now, without further ado, I present to you Forgiveness. The woman putting the tube into my penis has cold hands. She's younger than I am. Everyone is younger than I am. But she betters me in the wrinkle department. 
Scowl lines, frown lines, deep set creases between the eyebrows. The first woman to touch my Peter in fifty years, and she has to be a gargoyle. I close my eyes, wince as the catheter inches inward, my nostrils dilating with ammonia and pine lemon disinfectant, and something else that I knew so well. Death. Death has many smells. Sometimes it smells like licking copper pennies out of used public washrooms. Other times it smells like cold cuts pickled in vinegar, left in the sun to rot. On me it smells sour, gassy and bloated, and ripe. Here you go, Mr. Parson. She pulls down my gown and covers me with a thin blanket. Her voice is perfunctory, emotionless. She knows who I am and what I've done. I'd like to talk to someone. Who? A priest. She purses her lips, lines deepening around her mouth in cat whisker patterns. I'll see what I can do. The nurse leaves. I stare at the white cinder block walls over the hump of my distended stomach. Edema. My body can no longer purge itself of fluid. I look ten months pregnant. The morphine drip controls the worst of the pain, the sharp stuff. But the dull, cold ache of my insides rotting away can't be dampened by any drug. The room is cool, dry, quiet. No clock in here, no TV, no window. The door doesn't have bars, but it is reinforced with steel and only opens with a key. As if escape is still an option. Time passes, and I go into my mind and try to figure out what I want to say. How to say it. So many things to straighten out. The next thing I know, the priest is sitting beside the bed, nudging me awake. You wanted to see me, Mr. Barson? Young, blonde, good-looking. His Roman collar starched and bright. Youthful idealism sparkles in his eyes. Life hasn't knocked the hope out of him yet. Do you know who I am, father? He smiles. Even white teeth. Little points on the canines. I've been informed. Now watch his face. Then you know what I've done? Yes. I see patience. Serenity. Old crimes don't shock people. They have the emotional impact of lackluster history books. But the crimes are still fresh in my mind. They're always fresh. The images. The sounds. The tastes. I've killed people, Father. Innocent people. God forgives those who seek forgiveness. My tongue feels big in my mouth. I speak through trembling lips. I've been locked up in here since your parents were babies. He rests his elbows on his knees, leaning in closer. His hair smells like soap and he's recently had a breath mint. You've spent most of your life in this place paying your debt to society. Isn't it time to pay your debt to the Lord? And what are the Lord's debt to me? <laughs> I cough up something wet and bloody. The priest gives me a tissue from the bedside table. I ball it up in my fist, squeeze it tight. What's your name, Father? Bob. Father Bob, I've got cancer turning my insides into mush. The pain sometimes is unbearable. But I deserve that, and more for what I've done. I pause, meet his eyes. You know I was once a priest. He pats my hand, his fingers brushing my IV. I know, Mr. Parson. Smug? Was I that smug when I was young? I'm in here for killing twelve people. Another pat on the hand. But there were more than twelve, Father. Many more. So many more. 
His complacent smile slips a notch. How many were there, Mr. Parson? The number is intimate to me. Something I haven't ever shared before. 167. The smile vanishes, and he blinks several times. One hundred and... I interrupt. They were children, mostly. War orphans. No one ever missed them. I'd pick them up at night, offer them money or food. There was a place out by the docks where no one could hear the screams. Do you know how I killed them? A head shake, barely perceptible. My teeth, father. I tied them up. Tied them up naked and filthy and screaming. And kept biting them until they died. The priest turns away. His face the color of the walls. Mr. Parson, I... The memories fill my head. The dirty, bloody flesh. The piercing cries for help. The wharf rats scurrying over my feet and fighting for scraps. It isn't easy, father, to break the skin. Human teeth are made for tearing. You have to nip with the front incisors until you make a small hole then clench down hard and tug back, putting your neck and shoulders into it. It took a long time, sometimes hours, for them to die. I sigh through my teeth. I'd make them eat bits of themselves. The priest stands, but I grab his wrist. With the little strength I had left, he can't leave, not yet. Please, Father... I need penance. He takes a breath, stares at me. Watching him regain composure is like watching a drunk wake up in a strange bed. He manages it, finally. But some of that youthful idealism has gone. Are you sorry for what you've done? I'm sorry, Father. The tears come, a rusty faucet that has gone unused for years. I'm sorry. And I beg for God's forgiveness. I'm so alone. I've been so alone. He touches my face as if petting a crocodile. But I'm grateful for the touch. The tears don't last long. I swat them away with tissue. Together we say the act of contrition. The words are familiar on my tongue. But my conscience isn't eased. There's more. Rest now, Mr. Parson. He makes the sign of the cross on my forehead with his thumb. But his eyes keep flitting to the door. The way out. Father. Yes? I have to proceed carefully here. How strong is your faith? Unshakable. What if... What if you no longer needed faith? I will always need faith, Mr. Parson. For the first time since his arrival, I allow myself a small smile. Not if you have proof. What do you mean? If there is proof that God exists, you'd no longer need faith. You would have knowledge, tangible knowledge. He narrows his eyes. You have this proof, a lapsed priest? Defrocked, father. My title was stripped. Of course it was. You killed, I sigh. Wet and heavy. Uh, you misunderstand, Father Bob. They didn't defrock me because of the murders. My vocation was taken away from me because I knew too much. I lower my voice so we must lean closer to hear me. I know God exists, father. The priest frowns, folds his arms. The great mystery of faith is that we accept God without knowing. If God wanted us to truly know, he would appear on earth and touch us. I raise my hand, point at him. You're wrong there, Father. He has come down and touched us. Touched me. This is the tricky part. Would you like to see the proof? I almost shout with glee when he nods his head. 
said Father Bob. This story takes a while. He sits beside me, his face a mixture of interest and weariness. My mouth is dry. I take a sip from a cup of tepid water, soak my tongue. Fresh from the seminary, I was sent to Western Samoa, a group of islands in the South Pacific. It's tropical paradise, the population predominantly Christian. The Garden of Eden, one of the most beautiful places on Earth. Except for the hurricanes. I arrived after a particularly devastating storm wiped out most of Apia, the capital. It comes back in fragments. A series of faded snapshots. After a 20-hour plane ride, I landed in little more than a field. The island air and deep blue beaches were a stark contrast to the wholesale destruction throughout the land. I saw livestock rotting in trees. Overturned cars with little brown arms jutting out crookedly beneath them. Roofs in the middle of streets and jagged pipes planted in piles of rubble where schools once stood. Worst of all was the constant keening sob that hung over the city like a cloud. So many ruined lives. It looked like God had smashed his mighty fist down on that country. How could he have allowed this? I had to assist in the amputation of a man's legs without anesthetic because there was none left. I had to help mothers bury their babies using gnarled traffic signs to dig graves. I gave so much blood I almost died myself. Natural disasters are a test of one's faith. I shake my head. It didn't test mine. I was sure in my faith, like you are. But it made me question God's intent. We cannot question God, Mr. Parson. But we do anyway, don't we? I sip more water before I continue. In Western Samoa, I did God's work. I helped to heal, to rebuild. I restarted the parish. I preached to these poor, proud people about God's grace, and they believed me. Things slowly got back to normal. And then the murders began. I close my eyes and see the first body, as if it is in the room with me now. The eyes jut out of the bloody, ruined face like two golf balls pushed into the meat of a watermelon. The flesh is peeled away, in some places exposing pink bone. A rat pokes its greasy head out of a lacerated abdomen and squeals in gluttonous delight. Every seven days, another mutilated body was discovered. The police didn't seem to care. Neither did my congregation. They accepted it like they accepted the hurricane. Sad, but unavoidable. Father Bob folds his arms, eyebrows furrowing. Were you killing those people, Mr. Parson? No. It turned out to be one of my parishioners. A fisherman with a wife and three kids. He came to me just after he butchered one. Came into my confessional, drenched in blood, bits of tissue sticking to his nails and teeth. Begged me for forgiveness. The man had been short, painfully thin for some moment. His eyes were the eyes of the damned, flickering like windblown candles, both insane and afraid. He claimed he was the victim of a curse. A curse that had been plaguing this island for millennia. Did you dismiss his superstitions? At first. While Christians, the Islanders, had a distant connection to paganism, sometimes fell back to it. I tried to convince him the curse wasn't real, to turn himself in. I begged him that God didn't want any more killing. I was so earnest, so full of the word, convinced I was doing God's work. He laughed at me. He said that killing is exactly what God wanted. The priest shakes his head. He speaks with the sing-song voice of a kindergarten teacher. God is all-loving. Killing is a result of free will. We had the paradise of Eden and chose knowledge instead of bliss. I scowl at him. God created mankind knowing that we'd fall from grace. It's like having a child knowing a child will be hungry and then punishing the child for that hunger. Father Bob leans in, apparently flustered. God's grace. God has no grace. 
I spit. He's a vengeful, vindictive god. A sadist who plays with mankind like a child pulling the wings off of flies. Samoa was Eden, father. The real Eden, straight out of the Bible. The murderer, he showed me a mark on his scalp. I lift my bangs, reveal the mark at my hairline. Witness, Father Bob, proof that God truly exists. The priest opens his mouth. It takes a moment before words come out. Is that... I nod. I feel in a strength. The strength that had forsaken me for so long. It's the mark of Cain, given to the son of Adam when he slew Abel. But the Bible was inaccurate on that point. Cain didn't wander the earth forever, but his curse did. Passed on from man to man for thousands of years. Passed on to me from the murderer in Samoa. The mark grows warm on my head, begins to burn. This is your proof of God, Father. He stands abruptly, his chair tumbling backwards. I grin at him. How does it feel to no longer need faith? Father Bob falls to his knees, weeping. My God, oh my sweet God. Abruptly, blessedly, the burning sensation disappears. I laugh, laugh for the first time in decades, laugh with a sense of perfect relief. Father Bob presses his hands to his forehead. He screams just once, a soul-shattering epiphany that I understand so well. The Lord be with you, Father Bob. And then he falls upon me, mouth open. I try to push him away, but I'm no match. His first few bites are awkward, but he quickly learns my technique. Nip. Clench. Pull. The pain is exquisite. So much worse than cancer. So much better. I hope you enjoyed Forgiveness, as written by J.A. Conrath and voiced by Kristen Holland. If you enjoyed that last tale, I encourage all of you to visit Mr. Conrath's official website, jaconrath.com. That's J-A-K-O-N-R-A-T-H dot com. There, you'll find links to this talented author's social media, blog, and a newsletter you can sign up for to get his latest updates. Conrath is a best-selling author and writes books and short stories in the thriller, horror, and comedy genres. To date, he's sold over three million books worldwide. Books known for their fast action, snappy dialogue, laugh-aloud comedy, and nail-biting terror, often all on the same page. So if you're looking for something new to read, you can't go wrong with J.A. Conrath. If you decide to check him out and purchase any of his work, please do us a favor and leave him a kind word and let him know you heard about him here on this show and that Steve sent you. It would mean a lot to all of us. And don't forget, you can hear more of our friend Kristen Holland on his podcast, Nocturnal Transmission, just visit nocturnaltransmission.au or find him on Apple Podcasts or your app of choice. You won't be sorry you did. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave a five-star review and a kind word. And please, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. Of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week, when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. 
Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Roshek. Logo by Craig Roshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.